people, right? This is the year of people. We're pursuing everyone openly, passionately, lovingly, and effectively. Boy, I just want to talk to you about not only who the Lord is, but who you are. The best model we have is who? King David? No, Elijah? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus says some things about himself. So I don't have a slide for this. I'm just going to read them off real quick. These are all out of the book of John. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Thank you, Sister Sherry. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Uh, the next one, though, is uh, anybody ever heard of the eternal isness of Jesus? The eternal, I, I heard that sermon probably, see, I was still in California, so it must have been 1997, 1998. The eternal isness of Jesus. Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. He eternally is. I am. But what I want to talk to you today about, let me show the next one, is this. I am the God of you. I am the, now, because punctuation is important, it is I am, comma, the God of you. I'm not saying James is, all right? Because punctuation is important. And we, mo we have no problem understanding who he is. Or at least on an intellectual level. The self-existent one. That's what his name Yahweh means. It has I am, I was, I will be. All of that is wrapped up into Yahweh. We don't have much of a, of a problem understanding that. Um, the word says that he has no beginning of, of days or end of life. Completely self-existent. He's the one who spoke the universe into existence. As a matter of fact, the Psalms, the Psalms three times say the heavens declare the glory of, the, of God. Psalm 19.1. Psalm 56. The heavens declare his righteousness. Psalm 97.6. The heavens declare his righteousness. So we have no problem kind of, even on an intellectual basis, I'm not even going to speak on a spiritual basis, on an intellectual basis, even the world can understand who, who God is. They don't know him, but they can at least intellectualize who he is. What about who you are, who I am in him? I think this is where the church fell down a little bit, not only in their self-identification with him, but in who we teach the world who he is, and then who they are because of him. Amen? So we're going to start off in the book of John, we're going to walk through a few scriptures there in the book of John, and then we may jump into Hebrews and and anywhere else that uh, the time allows me to go. So we're going to start in John 5. And because it's in red, that means Jesus said it. And if Jesus said it, it is so. Amen? John 5. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Hmm. I like that one. <laughs> All right. Verse 25. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father, I like this, as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted to the Son to have life in himself. So the Father has life in himself. And he gave life to the son and has given him, so the father gave him the son, the authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Now, to execute judgment, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him wouldn't perish. God didn't send his son into the world to judge it but that through him the world might be saved. The Father gave him the right to judge us. And Jesus says, I'm not going to judge him. I'm going to save him. 
don't condemn your own self. Jesus didn't. Don't condemn your own self in thought or word. And don't condemn those you minister to in thought or word. It is the reason where I'm going down this path. I, I had the privilege, a, a friend of mine, um, uh, she and her husband just bought a house in Hawaii. And beautiful home. And she invited me and Cutie McHotter to come out to Hawaii and, and stay with her and her family. Uh, the reason that I'm going there is I've had a lot of jobs in my life. And I've been a mortgage broker. I've been a, uh, a real estate agent. I've been a, uh, a Beltway Bandit. Anybody know what a Beltway Bandit is? We are, <laughs> most of you in here are Beltway Bandits. Uh, those are the, the corporate leeches who suck off the government and get rich that way. I, I, okay, I, I didn't get rich that way. I worked for a dude who was getting rich. Um, and a lot of jobs. In one job, I was a mortgage broker. I, this is where I met this friend uh, who we, we developed a friendship. She's in, in Hawaii now. And uh, she asked me a question. And let me make sure I have this right. This was in, I still have the email. In 2005, 2005, she asked me a question. She says, James, why are you here? I'll ask you that question. Why are you here? And so my answer then was this. This is in 2005. Now remember, 2005, I was saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. But my answer was this. I believe we the human race. Our purpose is to suffer through this existence because of what Adam did. I go on in later paragraphs, say, I don't care if you are a millionaire, you still suffer through this existence. And that was in 2005. Why? Why did I have that as my answer? I'm going to tell you. I'm so glad you asked that. We're going to go to Hebrews 10. I'm going to tell you exactly where that answer came from. I didn't know this at the time because what I was being preached and what I was being taught was that guilty condemnation thinking. Hebrews 10. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, for the worshippers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for you had no pleasure. So the next one uh, is a combination six and seven. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And prophetically speaking of uh, Jesus. In Psalm 46, 8. So that's what he's quoting there in Hebrews. Is, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. But just prior to that, in verse 2 of Hebrews, we're going to go back. For then would they have not ceased to be offered for the worship of once purified would have no more consciousness of sin. I said that my purpose here on the earth was to suffer through this existence. <clears throat> Do you know if I ministered to anybody then, that's what I would have ministered Jesus said, I have life in me. The Father has life in him. That is not a life mentality. I am here to suffer through this existence. 
That is not a life mentality. That is a defeated death mentality. And as I sit here and think about it, that should be what the devil is saying. Not us. Not the body of Christ. Hmm. The plot thickens. The consciousness of sin is what holds most Christians back from experiencing that life. Whether it is a consciousness of something that you've done individually or just a knowledge of what Adam did. It is what holds most people back from experiencing life. John 5.26 says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he granted the Son to have life in himself. Life. 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 What is life? Well, I'm so glad you asked that because the dictionaries try to define it for you. The state of one who possesses, who possessed of vitality or is animate. Okay, that kind of talks about something that is alive. What about the next one? Of the absolute fullness of life, both essential and ethical, which belongs to God, and through him, both the hypostatic, which is pertaining to the tr trilogy, hypostatic logos, and to Christ, in whom the logos put on human nature. Jesus said he had life in himself. Life is the ability which Jesus possessed to tap into everything the Father has and utilize it for the good of himself and for everyone to whom he came in contact. That is life. If you tap into what the Father has for you, what happens when darkness comes into contact with light? Which one disappears? The darkness. What happens when death comes in contact with life? Which one disappears? Death does. That is the difference between Jesus' ministry and the Old Testament prophets' ministries. In the Old Testament, if you were to touch a leper, who affected whom? The leper affected you. In the New Testament, Jesus touched the lepers. What happened? They got clean. He didn't get dirty. Why? He had life in himself. You have life in yourselves. And I don't care what the situation looks like around you. I don't care what you're experiencing in your bodies. I don't care what you're experiencing in your bank accounts. We have an enemy. And his job is to get you off track. And the only way he can win is if we give up. The only way he can win is if we give him our authority. Because Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, and now you go in my name, which means you're going with all authority. And the only way the devil can exercise authority over you is if he usurps your authority. If he tricks you into using your authority. Now, we all know that the biggest trick in history was when Jesus trick the devil into crucifying him. <laughs> Don't let the devil trick you into crucifying yourself. He gave you life. He wants you to tap into There's absolutely nothing that the Father has which is useful for someone else that he wants to withhold from you. I so often, I like to say, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh. That word is the totality of his thought, totality of his knowledge. It is the totality of everything that's useful to you and to everyone around you. Are there a, is there a detail or two there that he, he will tell? Of course. When is Jesus coming back? He ain't going to tell you that. But he did tell you, I'm with you, even to the end of the world. He did tell you that if you lay hands on the sick, the sick will recover. He did tell you that all of your needs I will meet according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. Right, amen? He said, everything that I have, you can use. Yeah. That, that, that doesn't excite you guys? Maybe you just don't know what your father has. Can anybody say earth thing? Earth. He has earth thing. 
He has everything. And he made it available to you. That's why we've been going through this whole thing about renewing our minds. Because when we renew our mind and we remove that crust, that heart, and, and, and the, I don't have that image up here anymore, but if it, also, it, it looked like the spirit was protecting itself from the body and the mind, but actually it was the body and the mind protecting itself from the truth that the spirit had to share with you. And the more we chip away at that little barrier, the more we chip away at it, the more evidence there will be in our lives of it. And then it becomes easier and easier to do. It is tapping into the things of the Father for your benefit and for the benefit of those around you. That is one of the aspects of life that he wants us to focus on right now. What's another aspect? Jesus walked in constant communion with the Father. Constant communion. That's an aspect of life. He wants you to have that as well. And I think one kind of feeds off the other. The more in communion you are with him, the better able you are to tap into what he has to give to people. And the more you tap into what he has to give to people, the more you're in communion with him. <laughs> it's kind of a perpetual motion machine. But he wants you to have life and to have it more abundant. As a matter of fact, in John 10.10, 10, he says, The thief cometh not but for the steal to kill and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Then in Acts, it says how God, Acts 10.38 says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. All who were oppressed by the devil. Why is that important? God didn't send a plague to your house. Dad did not send cancer into your body. Dad did not cause a bankruptcy to happen or a foreclosure to happen. Dad didn't cause you to total your car. No, that's an oppression from the devil. That's why we pray every Sunday, Father, we will give you the praise, honor, and glory for everything which is good, and we will never blame you for which is bad. I love the way our Father reveals himself. And he reveals himself in layers, over and over. And here's the thing. There's an infinite number of layers. We'll be peeling those layers back for all eternity. <laughs> he kind of revealed himself. OK, before I do that. Jesus was hanging out with his, with his boys, and he said, yo, uh, who do people say I am? Hey, you're Elijah, you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus said, okay, okay. okay. Who do y'all say that I am? You know, Jesus was from the south side of Israel. He said, who do y'all say that I am? And then Peter spoke up with boldness. You are the Mashiach. That's what he says. You're the Mashiach. I mean, because they were speaking Hebrew. They weren't speaking Greek. You're the Mashiach. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Amen. And Jesus said, hey, Peter, there ain't no way you got there from anyone else but my father. Because there ain't nobody else down here knew that. <laughs> So he reveals himself in different ways to different people. Do you know that he revealed himself in the Old Testament? And not always to someone who was quote unquote godly? Good, good. I'm glad you guys know that. Because we're going to read a couple of scriptures. Because if you had said no, then we'd have to have a conversation. All right. The book of Daniel, he revealed himself. And the king answered Daniel and said, truly, your God is God. He's God of gods. He's the Lord of kings and the revealer of secrets. Since you could reveal this secret to me. Now, you know, uh, Daniel had to reveal a secret. I saw my friend, the king said, hey, you know, I got this dream. 
And if can't none of y'all tell me what this dream says, I'm beheading everybody. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna behead, I'm gonna stick you on a golden spit, and we're gonna rotisserie all of y'all if you can't answer this question. And Daniel said, hold, hold up, King. He didn't have the answer when he said that. He said, hold up, King. I'll get the answer for you because I know who to talk to. So he answered it, and this is what the king said. Now, I want to look at that in a couple of different translations. The Nazbi, the king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries or secrets, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. Okay, that's a good translation. I want to look at it in the Amplified. The king answered Daniel, of a truth, your God is God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. Amplified actually capitalized revealer. I wonder why they did that. Show the next one. He said, you're the God of God. Can you show me the next one, please? He said, you're the God of God. That's the Father. Have I not said you are God's and all of you are children of the Most High? That's Psalm 82.6. As a matter of fact, Jesus even said this. He answered them, he says, is it not written in your law that you are God's? And the law can't be broken. He's the God of God. Let's show the next one. The Lord of Kings. The Son. In the book of Revelation, John said this. He's made us kings and priests. He's the God of gods. He's the Lord of kings. And a revealer of secrets. In that one verse, he revealed himself in the Trinity. In that one verse. To a heathen king. All right, show me the next one. So we have God, Lord, Revealer. We have the God of Gods. Keep going. We have God of Gods. Who are the gods according to Psalms? You are gods. Listen, I didn't say you are God. Amen. You are gods. Lord of Kings. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. That verse says he's the lord over kings. Who are the kings? He made you kings and priests. And the revealer of secrets. The revealer of secrets. Reveal. The top row is obvious who he's talking to, talking about. He's talking about himself. The bottom row, he's talking about you. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I see my fact, that's Genesis 1.1. Anybody know what Genesis 0 says? Genesis 0. Anybody know what it says? God. That's it. He was the only one. Just God. Or in the Hebrew, Elohim. God, Lord, Revealer, God of God's, Lord of Kings, Revealer of Secrets. This secret wasn't hidden from you. I'm even going to say it wasn't hidden for you. It was hidden in you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then he started you know, saying things like, you know what? I want there to be a whole lot of plants and each one to have the seed in itself. Why? So that there will be plant after plant after plant after plant. Then he said, let the ocean teem with things and let cattle and stuff run across and I want them to procreate after their own kind. Why? Because I put the seed in itself. Then he said, hey, let us make a man after our image. He put that seed into the man. We kind of messed it up. 
And when I say we, yes, you can all get mad at Adam if you want to, and his wife Eve, but you'd have done the same thing. But Jesus came and restored us. And he put that seed in us, that restoration seed in us. 1 Peter 1.12, to them it was revealed that not, not to themselves, but to us that were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. And the angels are looking intently into those resurrected believers, to those born-again believers, because they can't believe what they're seeing. What? The Christ is now alive in you. And everything that the Father has is now available to you. It's now available to me. And that is the mystery. I am the God of gods. I am the Lord of kings. And I am the revealer of secrets. Amen. And the cool thing is, is that he reveals secrets to his secrets. And my wife goes, hmm? Okay. Who is his secret? You are. Are there things that are hidden from the world? Yes. And he reveals them to you. He reveals secrets and mysteries to his secret. It is absolutely imperative that we mature. It is absolutely imperative that we stop majoring on the minor stuff. It is absolutely imperative. Why? Because time is short. The Lord is coming back. And he needs a company of people who believe in who he is and believe in what he has done in them. Amen. It is so easy for us to believe that my purpose here on the earth is to suffer through this existence. Rather than without Jesus Christ, my purpose would have been to suffer through this existence. But now I rule and reign in life as a king yes. in Christ Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen? Amen? That is what is so imperative about our ministry today. Because if we don't tell people the truth, the devil will propagate his, propagate his lie. And people will buy into it. One of the things that Jesus had, one of the things that Jesus had was an uncanny ability to get people to believe that he was who he said he was and do what he said he can do. I do not believe in any way, shape, fashion, or form that it is a coincidence that that is recorded to start happening after he was baptized by the Holy Spirit. Because it said that in Philippians, that he set aside everything about himself which was God and was born as a man. Which means, as a kid, he probably got picked on in school. Right? Which means your people probably poked fun at him. He had to suffer just like a man. I mean, he, he had to go through what a man went through. And then he was anointed. And he could walk up to someone and said, follow me. And they could be fixing the next and just, okay. Where you going? I'm following him. Jesus had an uncanny ability to allow the spirit to so flow through and shine through him that it brought people's walls down, that they could believe that he was who he said he was and could do what he said he could do. Okay? Jesus says, you're the light of the world. If you're the light of the world and you shine a light on someone, you need that very same Holy Spirit to help them, Amen. to draw them. It's not you, it's not your elegance of words. It is the Holy Spirit doing the work through you. Jesus said, it is not I, but the Father in me who does the work. So it's not you then, right? Right? 
It's the Father in Jesus in you doing the work. Which means you and I should probably be doing the same thing. Right? I, for one, want to be a believing believer. It is very possible to be, to be an unbelieving believer. Which means you're completely ineffective in your ministry. It means you're completely ineffective as a Christian. I want to be a believing believer. As a matter of fact, I love the way that, that sentence breaks down to the point where even if you can't believe it's possible, can you believe that Jesus believes it's possible? Well, if Jesus believes it's possible, hook your wagon up to his train. Amen. And Jesus wouldn't have said it if he didn't believe it. Number one. Number two, he wouldn't have said it if it wasn't true. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Do you think he believed it? Yes, he did. Hook your wagon up to his train. Getting a word of knowledge from him to speak to someone about a situation in their lives. He didn't say pray for 50 minutes, begging and pleading. Silver and gold I have, I don't have. But such as I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, get up. I'm out. I mean, that's pretty much the way it went. They went down there for an hour begging and pleading. For an hour, they may have been back in the room talking to him. But when it came time, they just spoke the word. That's all he wants. He wants us to just speak the word because in a multitude of words, then you start coming into interpretations and no, 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 no. He said, don't, don't, don't get involved. Don't, don't, don't get involved. Just speak what I spoke. And let me do what I do. Amen? Amen. 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 Speak what I spoke over yourself. Speak what I spoke over your job. Speak what I spoke over your house. Speak what I spoke over your family. Don't get into a multitude of words. Just speak what I spoke. And you can speak it again. And then you start thanking him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We have another example, but we don't want to cut a board from him. Abraham. It says that the Lord promised Abraham a child. And that happened roughly when he was 75, 75. 74, 75, 76 years old. 70, Bible says 75. He was a hunter before it came to pass. Two decades before it came to pass. But it says that he grew strong in faith while giving glory to God. He grew strong, and if I'm not mistaken, I think I'm in Romans 4. He grew strong in faith while giving glory to God. Think about it this way. If our father assigned a blessing to you, and the only way that blessing could find you was based on your giving glory, would it ever find you? And quite frankly, every promise doesn't have to have already come to pass in your life before you minister to someone, before you give freely what he put on the inside of you. And in order for you to freely give what you have freely received, you have to have access to it. That whole process of renewing your mind to what he did on the inside of you. I am the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets. I am the God of you. You are my secret, says the Lord. Amen.